Well, the Mavericks offseason was a little bit shakier than we had hoped. The free agency bonanza, this final, final payoff to multiple years of Luka Doncic just absolutely balling out and killing it, becoming one of the best players in the NBA that was finally supposed to all come together. The money, the resume to fall back on was all supposed to bring a new star to Dallas, a new number two option. Don't let it get it twisted from the franchise. Mark Cuban himself said they were prioritizing a number two scorer. What happened there? Your best acquisition is probably Reggie Bullock. Three years, $30 million. And Bullock is 30 years old. He's been around for a while. He's bounced around to five different teams. But it's not a bad addition. For what he is, it's not a bad addition at all. That said, if I have to buy in on the idea that he is the big fish we've been hyping up for a year, mm, it's going to be... It's going to be rough around here. Pretty, pretty rough. But they also add Sterling Brown, another capable three-point shooter. The, really, the big move was re-signing Tim Hardaway Jr., who actually turned down something like $17 million more to go to New Orleans in order to stay here. I think, to be fair, his top choice was Miami, you know, kind of his hometown team. But once they made their move for Lowry, that kind of dried up. And I think at that point, he was pretty committed to staying to Dallas as long as the numbers were reasonably in ballpark. So interesting to look at there. Regardless, the Mavericks have reason to be at least somewhat optimistic, even though they weren't the big players in this offseason the way that we had hoped in free agency as we had hoped. They are still a team who has changed drastically. A new coach, a new general manager, you have most of the coaching staff turned over, of course, but really, you're going to have your success of your season ride on three key X factors. And that means, no, I'm not just talking about Luka Doncic taking another step forward because at some point, the man's feet will get tired. Yes, that was a really far reach for not that great of an analogy anyway, but it's the best we can do because George over here, our new freaking rider, can't Keep up with the teleprompter, man. I'm reading. Type faster. I don't care if we're on a time constraint and we should have written this out ahead of time. We're in it. We're doing it. George, if you're going to work out here, you really got to check your attitude. I am sick of your shit. Anyway, so with that, the Mavericks have three key role players, three key X factors, if you will, that give us reason to believe this team may still be dangerous. Here is George. Delete that last line. We can do better. George. I'm not even wearing my watch. Unbelievable. You didn't lay my watch out for me? Unreal. Unreal. These are the three key role players that will determine how far Dallas goes. First up on the list, we have Jason Kidd. What? The head coach. The head coach. That's your X Factor. George, what is this list? Gah, all right. We're, we're just going to roll with it. Screw it. We're going to roll with it. Number one, Jason Kidd. Now, Jason Kidd is the new Mavericks head coach. He's been a head coach in two stops previously with, let's say, mixed results. Jason Kidd hopefully has grown a lot in a couple years. He's been with the Lakers these past couple of years, obviously won a title as an assistant during the Orlando bubble. And, you know, that's great. He's had a lot of time and perspective to realize the psychological warfare and the absolute mental mind games, which would... George, that's redundant, George. You're fired from writing. You keep running the teleprompter, but you're fired from writing. This is ridiculous. George, my goodness. <sighs> Hopefully, Jason Kidd has grown considerably in these couple of years. He is still a coach that I believe can help Luka Doncic develop because... Say what you will about Rick Carlisle. I think he is a good coach. I just feel that he's kind of being left 
in the past a little bit. I actually anticipate Indiana getting a little bit better with Carlisle within the next couple of years. Now, does that mean that they're going to be contender status? I don't think so, certainly, but I think they can get a bit better all the same. I think really Jason Kidd is a good prospect at this point for coaching Luca forward because Carlisle and Luca, they didn't quite gel, just like Carlisle and Rondo didn't gel, just like Carlisle and originally even Jason Kidd did not gel. And they had to kind of find that happy in between. And we thought maybe Carlisle was kind of finding it at times with Luca, but then you saw numerous instances that suggested the contrary was true. So with this, with Jason Kidd having the all-time great career that he had, one of the greatest point guards of all time, with Luca being a generational talent as he is, there's reason to believe that Jason Kidd should have a fairly light workload. He already has plenty of weapons that he can utilize. A, a slew of high quality three point shooters, a generational talent who has the ball in his hand like 90% of the time. And I mean, not to give away anything in the list, but Kristaps Porzingis, if you can find unicorn status again, you got the ultimate X factor. And no, I'm not saying that to foreshadow something on the list, but Kristaps Porzingis, if he can actually come off of his first fully healthy off season in like three or four years, actually having time, a full off season of rest and to actually go under the hood and rework his game a little bit, there is reason to believe you have all of the tools you need and that really you're just kind of trying to stay out of the way somewhat. You're trying to work with the team and let the talent you have speak for itself. Don't overthink it. Don't go hiding Kristaps Porzingis as a seven foot three decoy in the corner and ask him to do nothing else in a playoff series. Oh, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, continue. Number two, we have Tim Hardaway Jr. Yes, the biggest contract the Mavericks signed this free agency. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of doubt. There kind of was in the days leading up to free agency about whether or not Timmy was going to stay here in Dallas. But at this point, I'm really curious to see. He seems to have found a good home here. His three-point percentage went from about the low 35% range up to 37, 38, 39% even with Luka Doncic. There's no question that as a third option, not necessarily the third option, Tim Hardaway Jr. is a capable shooter, a good fit alongside Luka Doncic and a guy who on any given night can be your second best or even your best player, frankly, in terms of point production at least. So Tim Hardaway Jr., now that he finally got paid, the past two years we've been kind of talking about, hey, he could opt out. Going into this last year, he could have opted out instead of taking the player option, tried to secure a longer-term deal because he had a good year two years ago. He could have done it and made a bunch of money. He didn't, and I thought that was a little bit of a risky move, but it paid out for him in the end, and now the result is after two years of kind of being arguably on a one-year deal, that sounds funny to say, but it's true, he now actually gets the benefit of having some long-term security. Some players, it's human nature. Some players, they've been chasing that, grinding for that, working, working, working. They get there, and there's a little tendency to be complacent. And I'm not saying that's what Hardaway is going to do. In fact, I obviously hope it's not what he's going to do. But you do have that tendency with certain guys to get complacent, to let off the throttle, and to just be relatively content. And you see it a lot more than the NFL, frankly, but you do see it in the NBA as well. Role players who get a huge contract because of their skill, like Bertans, goes to Washington and then goes from being one of the best three-point stretch players in the league to just utter trash. Now, hopefully, we're not going to have anything with that with any of these guys, whether we're talking about Sterling Brown and his 42% three-point shooting last year with Houston, whether we're talking about Reggie Bullock and how good he was the last couple of years with the Knicks. There's reason to hope that these guys who finally got paid are going to now continue as they've been doing, or even take that next step forward now, aided by playing with Luka Doncic. I fully expect Tim Hardaway to be as good, at least, as he has been the past couple of years. But really, I think my expectation personally is actually higher for him now. Because at this point, when Josh Richardson came in, we said, hey, man, maybe he can push and be the real number three and Hardaway can be 3B. That's not going to happen. Not only is that not going to happen, there is no 
there's no other alternative on the horizon. Hardaway is the third man, and a lot of times he might even have to be the number two guy, depending on what happens with KP. So expectations are huge, man. You got to deliver. And number one, we have the man himself, Reggie Bullock. Now, part of what went wrong for Dallas the past couple of years as they tried to create this sort of philosophical shift from just being a relentless, methodical, not even methodical, that's not even a good term to use in this case, just trying to run everybody off the court. We saw the historic efficiency from the offense two years ago, and they looked at that and said, you know, that wasn't good enough to get past the Clippers. We fell in six. We need to get a bunch of long, lanky 3 and D weapons. And so you saw the move. They trade Seth Curry, who, by the way, is an unreal value contract now, playing for his father-in-law, Doc Rivers, in Philadelphia. And they move him for Josh Richardson, which was an intriguing piece. Even though he had had a little bit of a down year the year before with Philadelphia, he was only a year removed from excellent production in Miami. And Dallas bought into that. The idea that they could get Richardson, a guy who all-around game, all-around impact was greater than Curry, even though Curry is the second most efficient three-point shooter in NBA history with a minimum of a thousand temps. Even though he's so good is Curry, they thought they could get a better all-around impact player in Josh Richardson. And not only did Richardson fail to live up to that, but he was unplayable in the postseason Unless Dallas was at the foul line. That's the only scenario in which Josh Richardson was nails. Put him at the line with the game on the line. Knock it down. That's great, man. Especially for this team last year. Woo! Luka Doncic is like sub 60% career playoff free throw shooter. I mean, good lord. But you want to talk about that kind of production? Yeah, that's not worth what we gave up, dude. I'm talking to you, Josh. And you, George. Make the prompt better. Make it clearer, man. Goodness. Oh, good help. Hard to find. What? Man. Josh Richardson did not live up to what they had hoped for in Dallas. Reggie Bullock is not Josh Richardson 2.0. He's not. As much as you might think that, as much as you might look at it and say, well, look what they did. They still tried to run out and get a bunch of 3 and D guys. Sterling Moore, I keep saying Moore, that's a former Cowboy cornerback, SMU guy. Yeah, I know, my, mind, my mind's pretty sharp about that. But no, we're, the bit we're doing is that your teleprompter writing sucks, George. Come on! Sterling Brown is a good three-point shooter. Very much stepped out of his typical production last year. When he was with the Bucks. he was a good, not great three-point shooter. That's some reason for concern, but still. He played, I believe, under Kidd, if I'm not mistaken. So, a little bit of familiarity there. Then, you have to take into account what he brings defensively, what Bullock brings defensively. Bullock, whenever Dallas would play the Knicks the past two years, Bullock was in Luka's jock after him, just making life miserable. Now, I say miserable. That's not to say Luka wasn't effective in those games. It's just that for what Dallas would anticipate and hope for in terms of playing the Knicks, granted the Knicks were good last year, they weren't ever able to beat them. They've struggled against the Knicks throughout Luka's career. And at least somewhat, the physicality and the bothering, the bothering and pestering done by Reggie Bullock has to be credited a little bit for that. Now that he's here in Dallas, he called it a no-brainer to come to Dallas and play alongside Luka. You got a guy who, again, shot like 40-41% from three last year, a guy who... Even though he's bounced around the league a little bit, five different teams, he's still been productive. He's still been a viable member of his team. And his production dropped off a little bit in the playoffs. Just a little bit. His points per game was in that eight range. But the Knicks in general struggled. I mean, they lost in five. They won a single playoff game and threw a party like they had just won a championship or at least a trip to the finals. So it is worth considering. I think in this case, Reggie Bullock is a better defender than Josh Richardson. If you're going to look at purely, purely what he was able to do with New York, you can say, hey, New York as a team was a very good defensive team, so his stats are going to get a boost in that respect. Same goes for Josh Richardson. Josh Richardson in Philadelphia per 36 minutes averaged like three and a half steals. But you compare Josh Richardson in Dallas last year to Reggie Bullock last year in New York, 
and you see how different their production was in terms of defensive ratings. Bullock forces a lot more steals. He's the same exact size pretty much, 6'5 versus 6'6 six, six, and 205 versus 200. It's basically the same size player, but I think Bullock has a grittiness to him that you just don't get enough from Richardson, even before the health and safety protocols last year that Richardson never fully came back from. You just didn't see it. And the three-point shooting with Richardson, he had been, again, about a 35% three-point shooter in his career. He didn't get the boost in three-point shooting like like uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. did. He certainly didn't get the boost of other teammates of Luka's last year, Maxi, Dorian Finney-Smith, who have continued to step forward year after year with Luka. He actually regressed. He was only about a 32% three-point shooter, which was the lowest mark since his rookie year. That's what Josh Richardson did. So if you're three and D and your defense falls off and your offense, your three completely bottoms out, yeah, we're gonna have some problems. Reggie Bullock will not have those same problems. Reggie Bullock, given what he is, the type of player he is, I think he is more than viable. And the fact that he's not coming in expected to be the number three guy, like there was some expectation on Richardson, even from yours truly, that he would come in and do that. Not that he listened or cared what I thought, but there was that expectation that he would come in and do that. And with Bullock, I think there's a little bit better tempered expectations. And so I think there's less pressure for him. He knows he's coming in. Richardson and uh, James Johnson came in talking about how they were bringing the dogs to Dallas. That is hilarious to think about in hindsight. But you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, Bullock kind of has that mentality. And whereas Richardson had been kind of declining, 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 Bullock has not had that problem. He's actually increased and gotten better in the last couple of years, even though he's a little bit older. He's 30 years old now. And so there is something worth considering to that end. If you want to see a better head-to-head -head analysis of him, check out my first piece on Mavs Moneyball. It is comparing Josh Richardson of last year to, uh, to Reggie Bullock and looking at their not just offensive production, but their stats, defensively speaking as well. And it's a really good piece, if I do say so myself, comparing the two players and telling you why Bullock is not Josh Richardson and why that's a very good thing. But that's all my time for this video, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please forgive George. He's trying his best. And George, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying. It doesn't matter if I've been giving you shit for the last 25 minutes. Yeah, no, I know. I don't care if you were sick yesterday. We were supposed to film. Ah, maybe don't worry about George. He probably won't be here next video anyway. That's enough. I'm Derek Kirby. I'm DDP. Whatever. Every legend was once a prospect. Ah!